You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Second World War interview. Today, I was joined by Dr. Alexander Clark, author of the upcoming book, Tribals, Battles, and Darings, The Genesis of the Modern Destroyer, for a rather wide-ranging discussion of naval matters before the Second World War. Dr. Clark is also the creator of a quite prolific YouTube channel, which has the very non-confusing name of Dr. Alexander Clark, all one word. On his channel, you can find literally hundreds of videos on a wide variety of naval topics. Before we dive into the interview, I thought I would first just give a brief overview of the naval situation around the world during the interwar years. This is a topic that has been covered in great detail, some would say too much detail, on the members' episodes, and there will be a much longer series of episodes on this topic sometime early next year as we start the slide towards the start of the war. But for now, I will just give a brief overview of some of the topics that will get brought up during my interview with Dr. Clark and would cast a long shadow over any discussion of naval warfare before or or during the Second World War. There were few things more impactful on the Second World War at sea than an event that would occur almost 20 years earlier in 1921 with the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty. After the First World War ended, the three largest navies in the world, the Royal Navy, the American Navy, and the Imperial Japanese Navy, were all staring down the barrel of another naval arms race like the one that had preceded the war between the British and the Germans. That naval race, which had lasted over a decade, had pushed naval spending to almost unheard of levels. Each of the three navies had reasons to want to avoid another unrestricted building race after the war because of cost reasons mostly, but the British had just fought a a ruinously expensive war and needed drastic budget cuts. There was a growing push for drastic budget cuts in the United States as well, as many wanted to return to the pre-war policy of at least semi-isolationism. And in Japan, there was also a very reasonable concern that the nation would not be able to keep pace in such a building race. They would fall further and further behind just due to the size of the other economies that they would be facing. The resulting treaty would put restrictions on almost every type of naval vessel, with the most impactful being strict tonnage limitations on the largest classes of ships. This included a complete ban on the construction of battleships and battle cruisers, except for the two battleships allowed to the Royal Navy that would become the Nelson and Rodney. This ban would continue until 1937, after a couple of extensions. And this had an important impact on the navies during the Second World War, because it meant that most of the battleships afloat in 1939 had actually been built over 20 years earlier. There were a few ships of newer construction, those that had been laid down immediately before or after the 1937 deadline, but those ships were very much in the minority. It also prevented new construction from being used to advance ship design theory. There were advancements, but they were all on paper, which had its limitations. While capital ship design would be in a period of suspended animation, in other areas technological advancements would continue. However, many of the advancements that we associate with the Second World War would not start arriving until relatively near the start of the conflict. In relation to the the naval war, many of these advancements were in naval aviation, with the latest generation of, of aircraft introduced before the war bringing with them greater carrying capacity, speed, and survivability. 
Even more traditional naval weapons, up to including the big guns on the capital ships, would advance during the years, with, for example, naval engagement ranges from battleships lengthening out in an attempt to outrange opponents. All of these changes made it difficult to determine how the next naval war would play out. Everybody was kind of shooting in the dark because there had been no major naval engagements around the world since the end of the First World War. There were essentially no recent actions to pull from when it came to naval actions, and certainly nothing approaching what, for example, aviators or armored warfare analysts had in Spain, Ethiopia, and China, where they had at least something to look at to to validate or invalidate their theories. Another major problem was the timing of rearmament, especially for the Royal Navy. In peacetime, weapon systems take a long time to go from design to an active piece of military hardware. For example, the Spitfire, the most famous British fighter of the war, and maybe ever, and their most capable one when the war started, had its first flight in 1936, three years prior. Similarly, the King George V battleships, which would first be laid down in early 1937, and all of them would still be under construction when the war began, had begun their design process in the mid-1930s, and a lot of their design decisions were even earlier made for, for paper designs that were never created due to the ban on building. Even much smaller ships like the Tribo-class destroyers would take almost two years from the point where the construction was started to when they were commissioned. This length of time between idea, design, construction, and commissioning for all naval vessels meant that the fleets that entered the war in 1939 were not the ships designed in 1939, but instead the ships designed in 1936, or even earlier. With that, I will get off my soapbox and and get on to the interview. This will be the first of many, many episodes focusing on naval power before and during the war, and you can expect many more naval discussions in the future. Also, remember to check out Dr. Clark's book, Tribals, Battles, and Darings, The Genesis of the Modern Destroyer, which is available for pre-order everywhere and is set to release on October 15th. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress, Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire, enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Second World War interview. This time, I'm joined by Dr. Alexander Clark, the author of the upcoming book, Tribals, Battles, and Darings, the Genesis of the Modern Destroyer. Also has a bunch of videos over on YouTube at youtube.com slash Dr. Alexander Clark, and also is the co-host of the Bilge Pumps podcast, where they talk about naval things most of the time. Uh, You can find links to all those (laughs) in the show notes. Um, We are here today to sort of on a very broad level, discuss naval aviation between the world wars during the interwar period, especially during the, you know, the back half of the 1930s. So I'm going to start off with a a fun question. So I think it's fair to say that there's a general criticism of all the navies around the world in the lead up to the second world war. 
And it generally goes along the lines of why are these navies building these battleships? Can't they see the power of aircraft? What are they doing? What is your initial reaction if somebody were to ask you that question? I usually go, okay, if you're that good, tell me the national lottery numbers for next week. I need to put them on. The, the thing is, yes, you can see the power of aircraft coming, but it hasn't arrived yet. No one's quite sure if it's there yet. And let's be honest, it doesn't really get there until in a reliable state, until we're talking about 19... 19- 42-ish, 1943-ish. Before then, it's very good in set pieces, but you have things like Taranto, which is a great victory, but it only lasts for about three to six months, and the Italian Navy does go to sea afterwards. It's critical, strategically massively important at the time. You cannot overstate its importance, but at the beginning, let, uh, let's be honest, it does get worn out a bit. And then you have Matapan, where, yes, that's brought around by air power, as is the Bismarck is brought around by air power, but it's finished off by the battleship because they are the more reliable tool. You can, it's quite possible that aircraft are going to get to the point where they're going to be able to get, kill these big hulking killing machines. But if you're a country dependent upon maritime superiority and maritime security for your survival, the only really guaranteed method of killing the big hulking killing machines made of thousands and tens of thousands of tons of steel are your own big hulking killing machines made of tens of thousands of tons of steel. You are not going to risk national security on an idea that something might be possible. If you go back in time, at no point does a sensible armed forces ever do that. Any time they do do that sort of thing, Usually, people at the time say it was stupid when they do it. It's a kind <laughs> yep. of, it's a no-win situation. When we're looking back as historians, we go, of course, they should have seen it. it you know, it's obvious. But if you're basing it off the exercises in the 1930s and the weapon systems they had available in the 1930s, and you always have to remember some of the aircraft we associate with World War II are, and so these are so powerful aircraft, are aircraft which are really beginning development at the end of the 1930s. They're not the thing available at the moment. You can sort of see why navies are going, right, we're hedging our bet. Because they are building carriers. They are ordering carriers. Every navy has some sort of carrier program going. Um, I'm never quite sure whether I include the Graf Zeppelin in that, but we'll leave that to one side. That's the German navy, and I could be rude about their particular over-engineered solution for everything all day long. They look lovely, I admit, but there's so much over-engineering, do not try and maintain them in a salt water environment. Please. Uh, and sometimes, sort of, it's a reverse, it's like things like swordfish. I'm always getting told by people, that shows the Royal Navy was not air-minded, they had the swordfish. And you go, so name another aircraft which could launch a long-range night strike with torpedoes, get all the way there and get all the way back. And they sit and look at you and go, um, um, they, they start to come up and go, that wasn't available then. That wasn't available then. I was say, and, and also and do it, it in 1939 and 40. Yeah, this is the point. Do it in like, and also, here's the other thing about the Royal Navy you have to remember. Yes, they're using the swordfish in 1939 and 40. But in 1939, they actually have the Albacore pretty much coming into service, and they have the full, uh, and they have the next one along after the Albacore, the Barracuda, under development. So you can go, yes, the Royal Navy has a swordfish, but they have the next generation and the next next generation coming along. That doesn't sound that unair minded to me, and that's what they've managed to accomplish with the complications of having. Basically, their air service being jointly run with another force which sees the importance of air power but believes the most important thing is the heavy bomber to the point to which they sacrifice their own fighter arm, let alone the fleet air arm, which they weren't that keen on having. And they saw the Navy as a bit of a direct threat for money in terms of getting the heavy bomber through. Uh, and that's treasury battle. Please never believe whenever you see a service go, you don't need this equipment. And they're talking about another service of piece of equipment. It's not real. It's not true. It's a treasury battle. It's usually spurious. In fact, the first 
thing you can do to tell that something is important is if some another service attacks it, because they think that by forcing the other service to defend that, they'll have to sacrifice money in other areas, which means they'll get the funding they want. It's a it's a classic uh, op- operation, and it it's done almost every funding round by every mm-hmm. service. It's disturbing. So you mentioned earlier that you know the 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 aircraft available here in the 1939-1940 era period. So there is a huge amount of uh, aviation evolution between, say, you know, 1918 and 1939. Mm-hmm. So what was, how did the navies view aircraft? What were they hoping to gain from having these aircraft as a part of the fleet, both as on carriers and also on other ships and also uh, land-based aircraft? To be honest, they've always got three things in mind for aircraft. Reconnaissance, strike, and defense. Now, the fence can be anti-submarine, it can be anti-other aircraft. That's the defense option. Strike. Now, here's the interesting thing. Strike can fit into sort of two roles. Are you talking about strikers in long-range strike, or are you uh, with torpedoes or bombs, or are you talking long-range uh, strikers in terms of directing the fire of battleships? Because that's one of the first things the aircraft are used for to basically give you over-the-horizon targeting for your very big, very massive killing machine uh, to make your battleship more lethal. And that's a capability which stays very, very important right until you get radar really starting to come into service, at which point everyone goes, hang on, that's not really a safe role for an aircraft, and radar does about a 70% solution, and we can use that radar for something else. And reconnaissance is the most important, especially. Again, you have to always look at the navies and go, what are they building aircraft for? If you're building your aircraft and your fleet around the concept of having a big battle, anti test in the middle of the Pacific, or etc., against an, another navy, you're going to build your fleet in a certain way. If you're building your fleet to fight in a global manner across all the world's oceans and defend your maritime security and occasionally be grouped together for a big battle when it ca- when it's necessary, but otherwise are going to be securing lots and lots of choke points and protecting your trade and convoys, you're going to build a very different navy. That is the reality. So that's the other problem we get when we start talking about this and start going back in history. The amount of people who go, well, because this Navy hasn't done this, and I perceive this as being best based on what happened in this event with this other Navy, they must be wrong. And you go, no, they can both be right. Because what do they want their aircraft for? And it's when you start getting figures, there is no right or wrong answer. Often there is a, what is our judgment on what matters to the style of operation we're going to do? One of the interesting things I often get told about is that the Royal Navy didn't want to do multi-carry operations. Royal Navy is practicing multi-carry operations in the 1920s. The whole reason it uses to justify creating a rear admiral aircraft carrier in 1930 is because of multi-carry operations. That guy, of course, is Ab Henderson, who goes on to become the third sea lord, who's building the Royal Navy's fleet going into World War II. The entire operational doctrine the Royal Navy has around multi-carry operations. But then war happens, they have to have task forces all around the globe doing counter-surface radar, various option- operations in, in the case of Force H and the Mediterranean fleet and various things going on. And you know what? You don't want to send a task force without a carrier because whilst battleships are powerful, they need the carrier with them as reconnaissance and air defence and actually the two together work best. Let's witness Force C. That basically gets into trouble because it doesn't have a carrier. Not necessarily for the pure air defense role of the carrier, because I'm sure someone will write in pointing out the number of aircraft on a British carrier was far smaller than on an American carrier, and therefore that might not have helped with the attack, and we could get into the whole debate about how they could have broken up the fight of the air, attacking aircraft coming in, which made it easier for the air defense on the ships to deal them and all that stuff. No, not entire, not that at all. But let's put it this way. If you have an aircraft carrier which already has fighters in the air, it's far easier for that ship to coordinate with land-based fighters. And we know there are enough land-based fighters not that far away in Singapore and Malaysia who could have helped out Force C. 
trouble was they couldn't be coordinated with because 4C was trying to be under radio silence because they didn't have their own protective umbrella, so they couldn't weren't calling at a fighter still too late. Whereas if you you know if you have these things, you can start working together as a whole force. And interesting yeah. enough, that's of course the doctrine which then leads in the Cold War to justifying the sea harriers and the invincible class carriers for the Royal Navy when everyone's decided actually no, they're going to be fighting in the North Atlantic, they'll be able to get air defence from land, and the Royal Navy basically then around goes, well, if you're going to be doing that anyway, you're going to be transmitting a lot, so we better have some point defence fighters and some extra screening fighters, which are the what Sea Harriers are supposed to be, to help us control the air around them so that we have time to call in the fighters from land. And the whole thing is, there is this doctrine there are these ideas. They're being worked on in the 1920s and 30s. They do not come from nowhere. That's the biggest annoying myth about the Second World War. The amount of talk sometimes, but also other accounts, and especially in movies, where you get the impression, if you don't know the history, that the things just magically appear. And if you do any reading, you realize usually these things have been in development for decade prior it doesn't just magically appear and if anyone wants proof of that just think about cooking how much prep time do you have to do to get the good meal out at the end yeah it's a, it's a really good point and i think um something that usually isn't considered enough my, my own personal like biggest pet peeve and that I constantly kind of warn people against or mention is people uh, kind of backdating technology like you mentioned earlier. It's like you can't take what was happening in 44 and 45 and compare it to what was happening in 39 and 40 for, for anybody um, because yeah. it's, it's, it's simply unfair. Um, but, it, but you mentioned... The, the, the third one is always the American and Japanese navies in 1941 and people going, oh, this is how they enter World War II. So they were better than the Royal Navy. And you go, they entered war two years later after being able to watch from the sidelines and the, getting that whole generation of aircraft in. If the Royal Navy had had another couple of years, if the German Navy, the Italian Navy, oh, let's be honest, the Regia Marina had another couple of, couple of years, the Royal Navy would have had even more trouble in the Mediterranean than they did dealing with it. Because let's be honest, the Italian Navy is the forgotten Navy in World War Two. Absolutely. Um, so, so you mentioned that what the Royal Navy was trying to accomplish, what it needed to do for Imperial defense was an important sort of driving factor in how it was using its carriers. Um, did it also have an effect on the type of aircraft that were being placed on those carriers? Like did that, uh, did, did, it, did it change how, um, sort of the capabilities that were looked for and sort of the, the mix of their uh, abilities? Well, of course it's governing. If you're talking about Britain, Britain goes, right, where's our infrastructure and industrial base? It's back in the UK. Okay. What Commonwealth assets or Imperial assets do we have? Not much. That's going to take a time to develop, and it does take time to develop, and a lot of it doesn't get finished developed properly during World War II. So if you're operating aircraft on the other side of the world from your industrial base, you want them to be require a lot of spare parts regularly. No. You want to start to try and minimize that logistic strain. You want as reliable an aircraft as possible. And as easy to maintain as possible. So those become two of the critical criteria. Then comes up the other thing. Because the Royal Navy has this sort of idea, and it's slightly different from the Japanese and the Americans, who are Thinking about a big battle in the Pacific, that's their overriding primary concern, which is sensible, because, let's be honest, that's the major threat for them. But for the Royal Navy, the major threat is, what happens if one of our task groups around the world is caught by a big enemy fleet before we're ready? Before we're able, we've been able to put our big fleet in the right place. We're going to have to get it and gather it from forces all around the world and put them together. Rather like the, the NATO and allied nations had to do in Gulf War I and Gulf War II, the forces had to be brought from all around the world. That doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. So what happens if those forces are attacked during that time? So the Royal Navy starts to think about how do we counter that? 
and they look at their own World War One experience and go, well, the Germans managed to, although they didn't manage to do much with it, managed to turn off a strength advantage against us by basically running at, running away at night after Jutland. That's how they got through our line. There was minimal fighting, but uh, there was a bit of fighting, but wasn't much, and that's how they got away. So what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to fight at night, because if we can, instead of using that to go away, use that to launch attack when the enemy is less, less capable, and this is especially true in the pre-radar period, well, then we can win something. Because, again, it becomes a form of attritional warfare. If we've struck you at night and you can't strike us, we've taken out something of yours for very little risk, and then you've got to decide, uh, is it worth to keep chasing us? Because if you don't find us during that day and you're still coming after us, we'll then attack you again the next night and take something more. And it's the, the whole thing, it's a sort of deterrent slash psychological warfare operation for actual war. And it works. It's how the British are planning their doctrine. It's how they make these things work. But it also affects how you're going to design your aircraft and what aircraft you want. Because if you're going for long-range navigation at night, what are you going to need? You're going to need a navigator. So that means you need at least a two-seat aircraft. At least two. And if you're going to fly at night again and possibly launch a torpedo attack, you don't want an aircraft which is difficult to fly, do you? You want it to be as easy to fly as possible because it's going to have to land at night as well. And landing on an aircraft carrier is bad enough in, at any time, but landing at night, possibly damaged, that's a very, very dangerous scenario. And again, if you consider the Royal Navy, Again, thinking infrastructure, where are all our pilots? Where do, are they based? Where are they trained back in the UK? We keep losing, having an attrition of experienced pilots. A, we don't get the people back to come train our new generation of pilots. But B, we have to start pumping out far more pilots. So pilots and, air, and observers, the air crew, are just as important as the aircraft. And the next general thing you get into, and this features into the carrier design, is, well, as just as important as our pilot, as our air crew, are our ground crew, our fitters, because they're also critical to maintain and train and getting our aircraft airborne. And if we don't have good one of the uh, good personnel there, we're not going to get the best out of our aircraft. We're not going to get the operations and capability we need. And this is part of what leads to the armoured flight deck. Because the idea was, pre-radar, some of the enemy are always going to get through, and the flight deck on a carrier is a large, flat, open space. And again, these are navies which have been, Royal Navy especially, but I'm not be dealing with World War One experience, dealing with the idea of plunging fire coming in. They know what happens when you have a thin deck, or wooden deck, and the bombs go straight through. So yes, you're going to lose a couple of air, a few aircraft in terms of your ability to carry aircraft because you have less displacement for carrying aircraft. But here is the thing. If you have a wooden flight deck, the RN theory goes, then on day one, you might well lose that carrier. You might not lose that carrier. That's the damage. Who knows? But if you have any bomb attack, you're going to lose the ability to operate aircraft off that carrier, you're going to lose probably any aircraft in the hangar, you're going to lose a lot of the fit, all things which have to be replaced and repaired, and possibly your aircraft, your carrier has to go back and be re repaired. A little bit carrier, of armor. Carrier isn't, isn't use carrier isn't useful for very much if it doesn't have no. a flight deck that is intact. But here's the Royal Navy's plan. But yes, we have less aircraft on day one, so we're relying on breaking you up or maybe taking out stuff at night. But if you don't get a heavy strike in during the first day, we probably still have carriers operating on the next day. And more importantly, we still have fitters, aircraft and pilots to use on the next day. So there is none of this idea of it's going to be a short battle. It's going to be an attritional battle, a long battle. That's the RN doctrine. 
And you see this in their operation, because if you consider how they manage to operate in the Mediterranean, where they're fighting battles which last weeks, almost, in the, putting the convoys through, it day in, day out fighting, every night, every day, something going on. So, uh, what, uh, sometimes the Germans and Italians don't feel like flying at night. That's fine. That's not the nice thing. The British don't mind that. That makes their lives easier. But that means they tend to be even heavier during the day. This is, the, this is what the British have actually been preparing for in many ways. They've been thinking about it. But it's a very different style of operation of your carrier doing that than doing an American carrier operation. I would not want to take an American carrier into a Malta convoy, just as I wouldn't want to have to get into a battle of alpha strikes if I was any British carrier other than Indomitable, Indefatigable, or Ark Royal. You know, they're the bigger carriers designed for the alpha strikes with that capability thrown in. Ark Royal has it by sacrificing some of the armor. Indomitable, Indefatigable will get it because, well, Indefatigable and Impactable are the two, aren't they? Indomitable is the one that comes British carrier one. names are designed to confuse me when I'm trying they to think of specific ones. They confuse even me, and I, am, I wrote an entire PhD thesis on this topic, and even I get that up sometimes because it goes illustrious. Um, Illustrious, victorious, and one other, and then it, it, and you just go, why? Why are you doing this? Why? You're just being cruel. And the thing is, the British carriers are designed around a different style of operation under the limits of the Washington Treaty. This is the other thing. It's basically the American carriers and the Japanese carriers are prioritizing the Alpha Strike, and they're not putting in the armor. Because of the Washington Treaty, if they'd had the, if they thought they could get away with it, the uh, Japanese might might not have. They've always got more of an issue getting armor, getting the necessary steel and weight capacity than others. But the Americans, you can be guarantee if they had had the ability, the freedom under the Washington Treaty to build those huge carriers from the beginning with armor, with a metal flight deck, they probably would have. Let's be honest, the moment they get into the point where they have got enough free space in World War II to design stuff with it, it's called the Midway class. It I would say, comes out. And the Japanese it, do the same thing with, with their armored carrier. The Taiho. Yeah. Yep. The Japanese do the same thing. The Americans are And what the British are doing, they're building bigger carriers but retaining the armor. That's the Audacious. That's the Maltas. Because no one, none of these navies are stupid. They are prioritizing within a fixed spectrum for what they think are the likely operations they're going to be. The British would love the ability to launch an alpha strike. The reason the British have what I tend to call a strike carrier concept and a battle carrier concept, i.e. Ark Royal and the Illustrious class, and then an escort slash support carrier concept, which turns into HMS Unicorn, the light fleet carriers, and all the escort carriers, is because of the operating under the criteria of this treaty and having to be a worldwide force and having to think about things far more than just one big battle. They would love to be building up for a Jutland-style major engagement, but one of the first things that comes out of the British studies of World War I is that Jutland is unlikely to ever happen again. That's one of the first things they realise and one of the first things they start building upon. And that, that's interesting to bring up because I know that, you know, uh, my first question, which was, you know, mostly just a joke, but but I you hear it sometimes, especially out there on the Internet, is that a lot of people claim that the, the Royal Navy and these other navies building these battleships are planning for like another Jutland. But mm. it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like the Royal Navy thought that at all. Oh. The Royal Navy thinks the reason the Royal Navy's got battleships and is building battleships is honestly. Well, there are three reasons which start to come about. One is, as I said before, it's the only thing you can guarantee has got, has got a chance of killing the other big killing machine is your own big killing machine. I'm sorry, the world is that simple sometimes. I know we'd like nuance and complexity, but historians can't always be satisfied in that way. Sometimes we have to accept the reality. Secondly, they're building them because... They actually are impressive statements of evidence when they turn up. 
they have a cachet. The aircraft carrier doesn't yet have a cachet as a capital ship. The submarine certainly doesn't have cachet as a capital ship. Cruisers fulfill much of the role in the interwar years of the cachet, thanks to looking like capital ships. So thanks to looking like battleships. But battleships, when they turn up, battle cruisers, when they turn up, go, you're going to have to pay attention to me now, aren't you? And that's just important when you're building ships as their wartime ability, what they're going to provide you in peacetime. And finally, as time goes on, the British start thinking about these whole sort of dots. If you look at some of their pre-World War II exercises, there's one, I cannot remember its exact year, I think it's 1936, 1937. And it has two carriers paired up with four battleships in a one fleet as a task force. And they're working together. Now, the carriers have cruisers as their close escort and destroyers as their close escort. But they're working as one group. And that start is sort of the British sort of task force mentality. The idea is the carriers will find the opponent. The carriers will slow them down because that's what they're capable of that time. They might sink them, but they might also just slow them down. And then the battleship will go and say, bye bye. It works. It's not Britain thinking we're going to have a mass battle line. Everything's going to be Jutland right over again. We are going to be glorious and win this time. It's Britain thinking that was then. What is now? What do we know work? What we think could work? And how do we combine those two? Because, again, you don't take risks or gamble when you've got the world's largest empire, maritime empire, dependent on you providing its security. You just don't. So the idea you're going to gamble on everything by going, we're going to get rid of all our battleships and never build another one because we can see 20, 30 years into the future when they won't be necessary. And everyone turn around and go, yeah, but what about for the next 10, 15? Oh. Uh, well, they might well be useful then. <laughs> um, Possibly. And so... you must remember, some of the battleships are actually finished post-World War II. Mm-hmm. That's the mm-hmm. other joy. You know, and this is the other thing I, I, I tend to use against use in people who are saying battleships are a product of the interwar years and myopia. And I go, but some of the most famous and best battleships in the world were completed post World War Two, or show and, up right at the very, very end. At which point you have to sit there and go, everyone has learnt the lessons of World War Two during World War Two. If they thought it was a waste of money and resources, trust me, they've got other things they would rather be spending those that money and resources on. And especially if you're talking about the Royal Navy or the French Navy or or the crew on, because crew personnel are a finite resource. And a battleship requires a lot of them. So does an aircraft carrier. But honestly, you decide you don't need a battleship in service, you free up a lot of crew for a dozen or so destroyers, if not more. Um so you actually mentioned that, you know, their one of their goals is to find ships, slow ships down, let the world the rest of the fleet catch up. So it sounds like the the Bismarck chase was a textbook example of what they were going for. Pretty much Bismarck, Matapan. I have a title in my book about Matapan. I'm not sure if it survived the editors because they said it sounded gloating at one point, which I can understand, which is the only battle in history to have gone as theorized, which is Matapan (laughs) is the only battle in history. Uh, Basically, the pre-war theory had gone, torpedo bomber aircraft will attack enemy and slow them down by damaging them. Enemy will then be pounced on at night by surface forces. That's Matapan. It happens. <laughs> yes. It's, it, it, there, I can think of no other battle in the entire history of humankind at sea which has gone exactly as a theoretical battle did in an exercise. Just, just how they drew it up on the chalkboard. You, you know, you, you sit there and go, no. Oh, There has been no battle which has been... so. Admittedly, the British didn't get what they wanted, which they wanted was the battleship. But they got Mm -hmm. three heavy cruisers, and let's be honest, they almost captured three heavy cruisers. If the destroyer crews had had their way and Cunningham had 
ordered them, they would have probably captured three heavy troops, or at least one of them. That would have been an interesting sort of uh, story to It would tell. have been interesting getting them home. I think Cunningham's <laughs> theory was basically we would lose more ships getting them home, and we couldn't do anything with them once we got them. But I, I think there were a few, uh, there were at least two tribal destroyer crews thinking in terms of prize money. <laughs> uh, that would have been. How much uh, do we get for bringing a heavy cruiser in? <laughs> <laughs> What's the bounty on the heavy cruiser <laughs> in World War Two? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so uh, we talked a lot about the aircraft involved. We talked about a lot, of, a lot about the carriers. So, when we start looking at the AA defenses or the anti-aircraft defenses that are being placed on 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 all of the ships involved, um, I feel like you know I, I've read that that maybe the British were were not in as good of a position as maybe some other navies uh, at the start of the war. Is that something that you would agree with? Honestly, the British, if you look at them, in 1939 have some of the heaviest AA fits of any navy in the world. You then go compare them to the American and Japanese navies in 1941, you go, well, they're starting to be far more heavy. They've been watching for two years the British getting pummeled by aircraft. <laughs> it's been kind of realized. You start off, you've got the, uh, the tribal class destroyers, always a good example. One of the heaviest AA fits of a destroyer in anywhere in 1930. 1937 when they're being built. First thing they realized during the war is the double 4.7 inch gun. Love it, love it. It's beautiful for the engagement. Aircraft come in higher because dive bombing is a thing. And actually, unlike in exercises, dive bombers do consider destroyers worthwhile targets in wartime. And this is because of the false positive you get in exercises. In exercises, there's a limited amount of time and the enemy get points taking out the biggest, most powerful unit. So they tend to ignore the small fry, which includes destroyers. In wartime, the enemy just wants to sink a ship and get home, because they rather like being alive, and destroyers tend to be on the outer picket of a force, rather than in the middle fiery storm of metal and lead. Um, so destroyer becomes good target. And at this point, the Royal Navy goes, okay. So that's why the X mount, that's the uh, second firing position at the back, the one second from the uh, uh, second from the stern, gets changed to a double four inch high angle weapon, which the tribal destroyers then find actually sends a shell which is very useful for making enemy motor torpedo boats go boom in a fiery fall. <laughs> Um, they find that the, the 4.7 sometimes goes straight through them, which creates a nice hole which lets water in, but might not stop them launching a torpedo or being annoying. Whereas making them go boom in a fiery way, it's not nice. To it's generally board, better. But generally better to just take care of that problem right From the right tribal up destroyer's perspective, crew, the crew's perspective, a far better concurrent. And actually, the Royal Navy starts churning out some destroyers which have all four-inch guns, high-angle guns, and are basically AA destroyers to fill this gap while they work on it. And again, we go, oh, well, this shows the Royal Navy wasn't prepared. Then you start to go, when do they start work on the 4.5 dual-purpose mount? Oh, that's back at the beginning of the 1930s, and the trouble is it has proved the most easy development system. But they were even considering at some point in the tribal class design and others and others came up and putting in the 4.5 dual purpose. The fact it wasn't available yet and wasn't considered good enough, even by the time you get, then it gets paused by World War II and then it gets pushed on, which is why eventually you get the battle class destroyers come out during World War II, and they are armed with these double 4.5 inch turrets, but they're only given two turrets because the destroyer turrets aren't ready yet, so they're using capital ship turrets on destroyers, and they're so heavy, they can only fit weight-wise two on a ship. And they're also think... expen more expensive to produce and more difficult to produce, and they require more resources. And so you end up with someone going this, uh, producing this beautiful paper, and I've read this a number of times, people going, well, that's because the Royal Navy Model 2 learned that during wartime, uh, during the war, you didn't need heavy guns firing off on a destroyer. You sit there and go, that's not the case, because then... The immediately class after they do that, the daring class, which comes out after World War II, when they synthesize all of them, immediately, when they finally have the 4.5 turrets working for destroyer-sized ships, 
They have three turrets on them, three double four fives, and one of those is positioned off. Mm -hmm. And I the whole the, uh... time with the battle class, they spend their time trying to correct the aft fire because they want something to cover their bump, basically. I uh, I feel like I've read this kind of jiggling loose of memory here that during the uh, refits in the mid thirties, uh, they also had to put the old AA guns on on uh, stuff like the the Queen Elizabeths because the new better AA weapons were not quite ready development wise. They had lots of fun with pom poms and various other things, getting them to the level they wanted them to be, and the four inch high angle guns and all sorts of things they had fun with. It's one of those things, it's very easy in hindsight to go, well, they should have been putting it. But sometimes it's difficult turning a weapon from something you develop to something you can produce in the quantities you need. And you don't want to have ships going to sea with a mixed armament because that causes all sorts of logistics issues and potentially in conflict, if let's say you have two different types of four-inch triangle gun, which can take slightly different shells, if you ran the wrong shell by mistake in the middle of com a combat into the wrong, gu wrong gun, that could be potentially quite problematic. You suddenly have one less uh, gun, basically. And also one less crew. And one, yes, one less crew. It's also one of the other things is I get into with people, they're always going, well, why were they using mounts, not turrets? And sh well, mounts with shields rather than turrets. And you sit there and go, well, because of the weight limitations and various things putting it on the air on the ship. Actually, a shield made more sense because the turret would have been have to have been such thin metal. If it had been hit, the, sh uh, the it would have just turned into an enclosed ball of trap, which would have massacred the crew. So you could give them, A, a shield which was stronger and in pointing it towards the enemy, so that would give them more protection. But if it did get penetrated, the odds are that a the weapon would carry the shell would carry straight on, or if it did blow up, it's not an explosion; it can find space, so people are more likely to survive. It's one of those strange things that actually, under the criteria you have at the time, people are more likely to survive with that amount of weight being put into a shield and a mount than into a turret. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, and it also allows them to escape or move away from the from the weapon should they need to. Mm. Yeah, and you know, as uh, here's the other thing: um, the big advantage of the tribals was their rate of fire. They had double guns in every position, which the Germans found really annoying. They went for bigger cruiser style guns on their destroyers. And then we're going, well, how are these ships, these puny guns in comparison, 4.7 inches beating us? And you sit there and go, well, A, they have almost twice as many guns, and B, this is the real thing, they have lots of space thanks to being in shielded mounts to load them as quickly as freaking possible. Fire rate. So fire they rate is a, important. A, they have an insane rate of fire in comparison to you. You're, yes, you are launching a more powerful shell, but for it kind of crossbow versus longbow here. It you've got about what well, you've got about one shell in the air, and they've got about six heading towards you. I, I Your often one feel might that... cause a lot of damage. Six of theirs, the odds are at least two of them will cause damage. I feel like fire rate is a very underrated um, statistic when you're talking about naval guns, big or yes. small, during this period. Look, it's a big, well, big gun. It, it, it features in the whole way in the Royal Navy doctrine. You start to go. Well, why was the Royal Navy more interested in six-inch cruis light cruisers than it was in heavy cruisers? And you sit there and go, well, the Royal Navy basically worked out that the likely engagement rate, especially if they were fighting at night, six-inch cruiser could get a lot more firepower in the air than the eight-inch. And whilst the eight-inch can penetrate more armor, most cruisers, are not, especially ones with eight-inch, aren't carrying that heavier armor. And if you wreck the upper work, I all the super stru all the upper structure above the hull anyway. It's going to wreck that cruiser anyway. So you know, six inch is fine. Let's go for rate of fire. Let's have twelve six inch guns and see if you really want to have a party. <laughs> uh, okay, I am out of my questions. Okay. So, um, I was going to ask you about your. Book that comes out in August. Mm -hmm. Give you give August you some time. To, 
at some point. So, so I, August 15th is what the internet told me, and I'm August sticking 15th. to it. Uh, well, I'm hoping it is all interesting. I, I know I have to have all sorts of things done by July 12th, so they will all be done and all be in. No, it's cool. It's it, it, it's really random because my PhD thesis is still behind. Um, it's going out soon. Hopefully, it's been held up by academic stuff, but it's it's been around for years, just not being published uh, in mm-hmm. terms of available to download or that's sort of out. And um, the book, it's going to sound strange, the book came about, the topic of the book, because after I finished my PhD, I had two bugbears. One, I wanted to get away from naval aviation for a bit, because I just spent the last eight years of my life, including bachelor's and master's, talking about naval aviation and talking about aircraft carriers, and honestly, I wanted a brain break. Sorry for uh, bringing up those bad memories today. Oh, that's uh, uh, I'm I'm well over that. You know, it, it was a case of it, it was a hundred thousand words, a lot of many many years of my lifetime in archives. I love doing it. It's just afterwards I wanted a break, and I wrote ended up writing a paper because the other bugbear I'm doing is these destroyers had kept churning up at the same battles I've been talking about, and they kept doing interesting things. And I kept going, well, where is a decent book about it? And then I found a decent book, which is Martin Bryce's one from 1957. And I went, this is a great book. But the trouble is, this is a narrative history. And no one's put this into sort of the analytical context. It's just giving me the history, which is lovely. You you want books like that. You need books like that. But it's telling me what happened, but not why, and why they were chosen, if that makes sense. It's giving mm-hmm. me the part of the story, but not the fuller or the rounded picture. So I live not far from the National Archives in Kew. And I like to go there at least once a week in pre-COVID. Um, now it's more difficult, but who knows? We'll hopefully get back to that. So I would go, I went along to Kew for a few weeks and went, hmm, these did do interesting things. Ended up doing a paper and presenting it at a new researcher's conference for the British Commission of Military History. And most of the audience was sitting there going, uh, what were these ships not in? Why do we not know about these? Why does Canada have the only remaining one? And I went, I have no real answer for that. And so that's where the book came from. And it, one of the interesting things is you went through it and go, after you were sort of doing them, you were, I'd say after writing the book, and especially after writing the end bit about HMS Nubian, and this is going to sound really weird, but any historian who's ever, anyone who's ever written anything about the anything they get emotionally involved in, and historians do get emotionally involved in our topic. I don't know. Anyway, reading the of writing the final bit of HMS Nubian summary, I was actually quite sad because I'd written the whole summary of these three classes of the books, uh, these three classes of ships, the tribals, the battles, and their how. The concept had evolved, and then the Missile Age came in, and basically I've gone right now. The Missile Age thing has sort of changed because everyone gets obsessed with missiles, so it changes the dynamic. So this is where I'm going to end it. Also, because there's a limit in word count, you you can only write so many words. Publishers do not let you publish a 250,000 poem, especially not for your first book. I'm sorry, anyone, if you manage to get that through, good for you, but no. The key is to start a podcast, then nobody can tell you to stop talking. Yeah, that's or a YouTube what channel, I've done a bilge pump, a bilge pump, and YouTube channel. Um, and so what? Uh, so by the end, I was actually quite tearing up when I was writing about the end of Nubia because she had such a wonderful career. She went everywhere. She did everything. I mean, there is not a single major battle or campaign from World War Two you could name that this ship doesn't turn up in and go, "Hello, I'm here. Where are the enemy?" Send them to me. If she had been a battleship, she would beat War Spite for battles because the, the rule of thumb is when a battleship turns up and fires its gun, it's a battle. Uh, otherwise, it's a campaign. And just to go, well, you know, just because she's a destroyer, these things, these are counted as campaign honors rather than battle on. You have all these little actions included in this campaign honor, and you're going, it's kind of cruel. And she just gets scrapped. 
I mean, she get it just she treated terribly. They're just treated atrociously, for sure. There is Asante, which is named for the Asante tribe in Africa. They are a wonderful, proud people. They actually got back, I think, the uh, bell and shield they gave to the ship. They had rebelled against Britain and wanted their freedom. And this is all the imperial past. Didn't they? The British, of course. But the British did let the king come back, and they tried to make things a bit better. And this ship was part of that. And in return, the Asante tribe gave, rather like the story of HMS New Zealand, Asante, a beautiful uh, tokens of protection. And this ship goes through all sorts of operations in World War II, all sorts of dangerous stuff. Barely gets a scratch in comparison to other members of its class or other ships. And you sit there and go, that is definitely what you want blessing your ship. I think I, I think it got deleted, the line I originally put in the book, which was what you what the Royal Navy should be doing today is not just investing in war and defense, but also investing in making sure every single warship is blessed by the Asante tribe <laughs> or Maoris from New Zealand, because either way, it seems to work out well for those ships. Unfortunately, HMS Maori herself, another tribal ship, didn't get out to New Zealand for her blessing, and she does end up getting sunk. Coincidence? Perhaps not. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? There is more things on heaven and earth than we understand, to misquote for her right here. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it's the, the reason I kind of, uh, you post about it on the internet at some point, and the reason I got interested in it, because like, you, you don't see books um about the smaller ships in these engagements almost ever like yep. you mentioned like the last book was 1957 now i would absolutely believe it as a person who is you know for the podcast oh, and for I, my own I, interest I actively looking for things the like journal that. articles i think my <laughs> journal article uh which i think has come out with marine du nord and i think it's been published and never quite it was due to be published just before COVID hit and then COVID hit and i have because it and um, again you will notice from probably hearing about it or trying yourself, although I, I, I try and tell people not to these days. Trying to get an article through academic publishing for journal is a freaking nightmare <laughs> to end this. Huh? And at one point, I had six going through the process at the same time. And I basically thought, hang on, I'm poor. I'm an early career researcher. I'm from a family which is middle class but not very very rich middle class and by any stretch of imagination i can't afford to keep giving away words for free and keep having it come backwards and forwards as much as i'd love to as much as it's the way apparently to advance your academic career i can't afford to keep doing that so that's another reason why i ended up writing books because books and articles in magazines they at least provide some money and you need to eat <laughs> it's one of the other things I find funny about um, academia sometimes, especially some parts of the humanities, because I, w I, I teach history of engineering in an engineering faculty, is that humanities seems to have a different approach to the idea that staff need to eat versus other sectors sometimes. Uh, the engineering faculty does tend to remember that staff have things like home, family, and occasionally they even remember you have a life outside of university. Rare, I have to admit. Blasphemy. I, I, I love universities and I love working them, but I, I do find it funny the amount of times I get told, we've got a an appointment, uh, a, fu a faculty function scheduled for 7 o'clock, it's mandatory, and I'm going, um, no. But of course, the joy is I'm a contract member of staff, so I get to decide which ones I consider mandatory or not. Because if it's not on the day I'm actually at work there, then I have the perfect get out of going. I'm actually on someone else's pay slip that day. <laughs> Sorry. Oops. Yeah. But no, books and articles pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Thankfully. Hopefully. And and to remind everybody who's listening, you can find a link to buy that book or pre-order that book um, uh, in the show notes as well yeah. as on the website. Um, Dr. Thank Clark, you. thank you for joining us here today to chat thank about naval history. It was uh, it was a fun time. Okay.